who invented candy floss or cotton candy is the question that I will answer by the end of this show. episode of the more you know mondays the more you know the more you grow and this week on the show i will be talking about tony collins who unfortunately passed away on the 8th of february 2021 which was um the start of this month so r.i.p to him but before we get into that you know what we have to do we have to start the show with some positive vibes that we do every week in the form of monday affirmations though if you are new here and this is the first episode that you're listening to thank you for joining us and to my regular listeners welcome back these episodes are not um episodic you don't have to listen to them in a particular order or order <laughs> you can listen to them in any particular order as you feel i'm just grateful for those that actually do listen so every week we start the show as i pre-mentioned with monday affirmations and we do that every week in the form of a quote now this week is no different to any other week And this week's quote is, again, by an unknown um, motivational speaker. (laughs) Because that's what I'm going to call them now. Unknown motivational speakers. um, Or unknown wise people. Because the application that I used didn't quote who it was by. So I'm not 100% sure who it's 100% who it's exactly by. But the quote goes like this. Sometimes when things are falling apart, they may actually be falling into place. And I like this quote because it's kind of a a bit of that mental gymnastics, you know? You kind of think, well, if everything's falling apart, of course, of course, this must be a terrible thing. But what if... These things only feel like they're falling apart because it's something new. Something that you haven't fully accepted. So it feels like it's shaking things up for you and your system and everything around you because you're fighting what this new thing is. That's, um, I, I, I'm not sure what it could be. It could be anything really. You can put it into uh, the context of anything in particular um nothing comes to mind currently but it just the idea of something new when say for example you were going to a school and halfway through the school year um you unfortunately have to leave so not leave in the sense leave it in the sense of you move house so you're now living in a completely different area and for ease of access of the schools you change schools now getting used to this new school isn't going to be 100% easy because it's a new school it's a new place it's all new people and you've never met them before and you're going to experience this new place that may in the beginning rub you the wrong way and feel like everything is falling apart but as time gets on it feels as though things slowly are working in your way working um in your favor they no longer feel like the world is crumbling around you but instead it feels like things are falling into place and it's kind of, it's one of those things where like you, you hear those sayings when people say, 
sometimes you have to go through it to get onto the other side and be better off. But if you just, obviously in a perfect world, it'd be lovely if we could just skip the horrible, skip the terrible side, skip all the bad feelings. But it really shapes you as a person to go through these bad things, go through these bad moments, go through these bad negative feelings. Not for the feeling, not for the fact of having these feelings, because of course at the time of having them, it is not a good thing, it's not a good feeling. But sometimes you have to go through it to reform yourself into a different, maybe more understanding because you you understand a different situation. I can only put it in the form of like losing my father. It, the <laughs> now, I guess I can talk about it, but at the time of when he first passed away, it felt like my world was crumbling apart. I didn't know what I was going to do. Obviously, I knew I was going to continue with my life. I was still alive, but there's a lot of things that I now know that are no longer possible for me to do because he's no longer around. And these are all things that slowly in the last five years I've had to come to terms with. And in the beginning, they felt like the end of the world situations as if... <sighs> I, I can't think of an exact example without making myself fully emotional. Um, not fully emotional, but somewhat emotional. And I want to stay on the same kind of plane to deliver what I want to say. Um, but just, just, just the thought of, yeah, I, I, I can't actually put it into words exactly, but just just at that moment in time I felt it wasn't fully possible to do certain things or I couldn't go on or I but there's certain things that I've come to terms with that are not possible but there's also things that there are still things that are still possible because it's not as though I am an orphan I do still do have an amazing mother so it's not completely the end of the world, but just not having the, I guess, the complete stability of both parents is what I'm used to, is what I've grown up with my entire life. So losing that, I guess, one leg of the, the foundation makes the whole foundation a bit shaky. And in the beginning, everything was much more shakier than this but as time's gone on and we've as a family me my mum and my brother we've figured out a version of the new normal which is the new foundation that keeps us standing without my dad being around which me saying out loud I feel bad saying it but It's it, it's hard to fully come to terms with it, but it's something that I have to do to be able to move forward. Because if I'm constantly living in the past, then what am I doing with the present? It's useless if I if I if I spend my life in the past, the present is being neglected, and forget about the future because I'm in the past. And that's not healthy for anyone, in my opinion. I'm not a psychologist. I don't have a degree in psychology anyway. So I'm just speaking my mind. But those are my Monday affirmations. I hope that they bring you some sort of meaning. You get some sort of connection to it. Or maybe you just think I'm speaking mumbo jumbo. I don't know. I don't mind. At the end of the the day in my opinion means nothing so take it or leave it but those were my monday affirmations 
make sure to I, I wouldn't say overanalyze your life but be aware that things that feel like the end of the world in the beginning could end up being your salvation at the at the end when everything is said and done and as bad as that might sound thinking about it depending on your situation i think coming to terms with things and beginning to live in a new normal is for the better and i don't think i, I don't want to use that in the situation of lockdown because lockdown is it's not healthy for human beings in general we're not creatures that are meant to be locked down and kept w- without being able to socialize um and hug <laughs> it's one of the things i miss doing you know hugging people <sighs> but anyway enough about me enough about monday affirmations i, I hope um you you've enjoyed these and you take the meanings that you're meant to make f- and take from them and I, i'm sure i'm repeating this but hey ho it's my show and i'm the only one on it but anyway tony collins who was born anthony norman collins was born on the 19th of march 1926 and died on the 8th of february 2021 He was an English football player, manager who became the first black manager in the football league and scout who the press dubbed as football master spy which already says a lot about this amazing man. He's a true pioneer in football history and 100% a legend. that more people need to know about so in his early life he was born in kensington london to white mother and black father but was adopted by his maternal grandparents and grew up around the portobello road area um as a schoolboy he was a promising footballer and played for the local football team Acton United and was due to sign for Brentford until he was called up for military service during the Second World War. Now during his time in the war he spent 3 years of what he spent or he did 3 years of wartime service where he was stationed in Padua in Italy. During a few army football matches he was recommended to play for Sheffield Wednesday which is how you know how good he was and after being demobbed and returning to England he signed for Sheffield Wednesday in November 1947 but unfortunately he didn't make any first team appearances although he did make his first football league debut for York City which was in the third division north which was a tier of football league system between 1921 and 1958 i'm not 100% in favor of uh, the football league tier system but there you go For anyone that would didn't know the third division north was an old style of like i guess say like league 1 league 2 and the premier league but it wasn't until 1949 in july when he joined york city to make his first football league debut after that he was transferred to watford in august 1950 after watford however He joined Norwich City in 1953 and then Torquay United in 
after a brief return to Watford in 1957 before he signed at Crystal Palace where he became Crystal Palace's first black player to appear to appear in the team he later joined his final club as a player of Rochdale in June 1959 which in total by the end of his career of his playership or <laughs> of him being a football player and when he retired in 1961 Tony Collins had made a total of 333 Football League appearances, scoring 47 goals, which is not bad for a left winger. At the end of his first season at Rochdale, the manager at the time, Jack Marshall, left the club to join Blackburn Rovers. And after being encouraged by his teammates to apply for the post, Tony Collins was appointed player manager of the 4th Division Club in June 1960, where he became the first non-white manager of a football league club. In his second season, Rochdale reached the League Cup final only to lose 4-0 in, on aggregate to a second division team, Norwich City. And as of 2019, it remained the club's only appearance in a major final, which is some achievement that stood the test of time until, well, two years ago. So well done, Rochdale. After leaving Rochdale, however, he became the chief scout for Bristol City and then under the manager of Don Revy at Leeds United and when Revy became the manager of the England national team Tony Collins was also working for him compiling dossiers on the opponents which is where the press dubbed him as football super spy or master spy when some information was leaked to the press about an opponent against Scotland. Feel free to do all your own research yourself and get ma get maxed. <laughs> get back to me if you find out something different. For, but from my research, that was the reason why he would, the press dubbed him as football super spy. But I'm interested to hear other answers if there are other answers out there. So at the same time now, that makes me sound like a bad journalist because I didn't look at the other answers, but I did look at the other answers and the only answer that I could find. Do you know like when you feel like you're digging yourself in a hole? That's this moment right now. So as I said in the beginning, my opinion means nothing. Take it or leave it. But if there is a discrepancy with anything I have said, please let me know in a DM message. Though now we've got that out of the way, <laughs> we can get back on with the learning. So he rejoined Bristol City as the assistant manager to and Andy? No, sorry, Alan Dix in 1973 and leave, left the club in 1980 after a brief spell as the caretaker manager. And a caretaker manager, for anyone that is unaware, is a term is a footballing term that is given to somebody who takes temporary charge of the management of a football club. This is usually when the regular manager is dismissed or leaves for play for a different club. However, a caretaker manager may also be appointed as the regular manager. So, again, these footballing terms that I'm not 100% au okay with, but the more you know, the more you grow, as the slogan goes. <laughs> He's also famous for being the footballing scout 
at Manchester United between the years of 1982 and 18, between the years of 1982 and 1988, where he helped the club find their future stars, Paul McGrath and Lee Sharp. Uh, Before he retired, Tony Collins also scouted for Queen's Park Rangers, Newcastle United, Millwall, Derby County, and also a short second spell as Leeds Chief Scout. He had an illustrious career and he will be always remembered and go down in history for the doors that he allowed to be opened for future black players and black managers and scouts, you know? Without Tony Collins to make history, who knows? Maybe, of course, it probably would have been someone else. But in this episode, we're celebrating the great player, a man of Tony Collins, and all that he achieved in his time of almost a hundred years. He not, he died at 94 years old. So he was alive for almost a hundred years, which is, I mean, it's crazy for, for me to imagine. That's like three times my age. Um, the things that he may have endured or things that he may have gone through to, get to where he was and maybe this might be weird to say but maybe it it kind of proves in a weird way that it's not always about what you look like sometimes your talent can be the thing that brings you to the highest places despite your color or what you may look like maybe you may not be the most aesthetically beautiful person but if you're talented enough you may make it further than someone that holds their looks as the highest um i can't think of what it the word i'm looking for but the highest kind of point on the pedestal in the sense of that's what instead of your personality or being the thing that people look for when they're thinking about you they think of your looks which is not always a bad thing but it can be a bad thing but maybe i'm wandering into uncharted territory not uncharted dangerous territory because it again it's subjective but i promised you an answer to a question when we got to the end of the show and as we're coming close i feel that it's only right to answer that question because otherwise you would have jumped be you would have jumped be you would have just been sat there this entire time listening to the show and thinking who invented candy floss and why and you would be right to be asking those questions And I find the answer to this question extremely interesting, especially with last week talking about William Addis being the inventor of the toothbrush and the week before that speaking about Pierre Farchard or Farchard, Farchard maybe, Um, (laughs) who was the father of modern medicine and also the fact that i work in dentistry i found it kind of really kind of funny um that it was just a little joke that i thought at the same like while working in an office and seeing dentists and not i mean i've worked in a dental surgery before but i mean even in the dental surgery it was bare chocolates around dentists love chocolate right and I just thought it was kind of funny. They fix teeth, but they love chocolate so much. And 
Then I stumbled upon this quote, not this quote, this interesting fact about the invention of candy floss. So, coincidentally, candy floss, or cotton candy as it's known in America, was invented by the dentist William Morris um, with the help of the confectionery or confectioner John C. Walton. Together, in 1897, the pair designed and patented what they called an electric candy machine, which was a metal bowl containing a central spinning head filled with sugar crystals and uh, base and per, uh, perforated with minuscule holes their creation worked like modern day candy floss like uh, candy floss machines do today sorry so in 1904 was the first time that morris and walton's electric candy machine first became of the attention of the public which was at the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. This was popularly known as the St. Louis World World's Fair, which was a seven-month-long extravaganza featuring amongst the exhibitions were such acts as the re-enchantment of the Boer War, the world's largest pipe organ, a 265 foot observation wheel, an elephant water slide, <laughs> um, which must have been a huge, is all I can think about, because to fit to allow elephants to slide down and then also strong enough for the elephants to slide down the slides is what i think an elephant water slide is unless an elephant water slide is actually a really big water slide um but i'm definitely gonna look it up after recording this episode (laughs) And an estimated 20 million people attended the Louis, the St. the Louis, the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. Uh, and these are the people that, um, William Morris and John C. Walton sold 68,655 helpings of candy floss. They packaged the candy floss in wooden boxes and marked it as fairy floss. Um, Back in those days, when the electric candy machine was first made, they didn't actually call it candy floss. It was actually called fairy floss funnily enough it didn't actually get the term candy floss or cotton candy Um, this term was adopted in the 1920s funnily enough um, this was by another dentist uh, a candy parrying dentist by the name of Joseph Laskoff, or Lasko, who sold cotton candy to his patients, which, I don't know about you, but doesn't seem very ethical. Um, Because if you're selling candy floss to your patients, then, I mean... Doesn't seem very very ethical, but at the same time, I guess it's good for business. So, like, you give them an exam, check all your teeth are fine. Yeah, your teeth are fine. And um, afterwards, he would just like um, 
give them some cotton candy. It was like, go away with this. Uh, you'll love this. Mm, nice and sugary. Mm. Knowing that the more of this cotton candy that they ate, the more cavities they would possibly get. And then they would be back in the dentist so that this dentist could make more money. But I don't know his motives, of course. I'm just speculating. But when <laughs> when a dentist sol- sells candy to his patients, <laughs> it doesn't sound very... <laughs> Just dentists and loving candy, man. Um, so his attempts failed. Not his attempts. He attempted to improve on, um, the invention of that was the original invention that was made by Morris and Walton of their electric candy machine or candy maker, uh, their cotton candy machine. And, He wanted to improve it in the facts of their machine, Morris and Walton's original machine, I should say, um, had a tendency for rattling, shaking and falling apart. So Joff, uh, Joseph, sorry, wanted to make somewhat of an improvement on this, but his attempts on trying to make the improvements failed. Funnily enough, it wasn't until 1949 when this problem was solved. It was solved by the ingenuity of gold medal products of Cincinnati, um, which is still to this day the world's main producer of cotton candy machines. Which is pretty, pretty good. <laughs> I mean, running the hot press of making that cotton candy for the last, I want to say, 70 years. Quick maths. Um, but pause, let's say about 70, because then I'm kind of right. <laughs> but. The invention of cotton candy isn't officially a modern invention. According to Tim Richardson's Sweets, A History of Candy, apparently cotton candy can be dated back to at least the 15th century when a creative Italian cook fashioned fantastic sculptures from spun sugar first melting the sugar then drawing it in with a fork and draping a thin strand over a wooden broom handle and then also again in the 16th century with henry the third of france who which is the most craziest thing for me because this seems like a modern thing having like so much confectionery um all around but in the 16th century as i was saying henry the third of france on a state visit to venice was treated to an all sugar banquet which was complete with spun sugar cutlery and tablecloth This was in the 16th century, you know, these men, they had ingenious ideas and they were like, what if, I know it's going to be out there, but what if we had a completely, a complete dinner made out of sugar and everyone's just like, oh, no, you can't do that. What do you mean? It was like, no, 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 check this out. So we're going to. Your knife and fork, all your cutlery, your t- the tablecloth, it's all going to be edible. And everyone's just like, oh, no, it's crazy. That, that can't be possible. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's going to be possible. And it's going to go down in history. <laughs> and, and it did. Though, with that being said, none of those previous things from history were as advanced 
as the cotton candy machine. So, although there have been plenty of tricks for twisting and spinning sugar, nothing was on the same level, or the world had never seen something such as cotton candy before it was designed and patented. Though... Back in those days, it could only be found at like a carnival or something. And nowadays, you can get like a, a candy floss machine in your house. So it shows how far things have gone. And But anyway, I will call that the end of the show. So thank you for listening, anyone at home. And I hope you've enjoyed episode 14 of The More You Know Mondays. Next week, I will be talking about something completely different. Um, but, or maybe be on the same wave, who knows? But I hope you've enjoyed the fun facts and the positive vibes and motivations of this episode. And please do join us next week where there'll be more of what I just said. <laughs> And uh, if you listen to this show on YouTube, then please subscribe to My Opinion Means Nothing. There will be more, I don't know, cool stuff coming in the future when I can meet up with other people and actually film things properly. Pro- properly. I've been having this problem earlier. I was trying to say properly, and probably, and I kept saying either one irrespectively in the wrong context. But I'll get there in the end. I've got time in lockdown until the Prime Minister announces this roadmap. Um, but until that happens, unless it already has and I've missed it by not watching the news, who knows? <laughs> but until that happens, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. And if you're listening to this at the start of your Monday, have a wonder- wonderful rest of your day. And if not, enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you for listening and goodbye.